This is the great question that has always struck me. It's why I continue to study the Great War. I have for 20 years. Uh, what I wrote about it in, at the Sharp End and Shock Troops, that was the question I wanted to get at, is how did they cope? How did they endure? How did they make sense of war? How do soldiers kill? How were they killed in turn? Um, what is the experience of battle? And how did you go from a really relatively ordinary Canadian on a farm or in a city to in the trench? And then how did you deal with that death and destruction where soldiers are being killed all around you? Your friends are being maimed, um, uh, shell fire, poison gas, snipers, claiming men by the dozens and then the hundreds and then the thousands and the list goes on. So how did they cope and endure? Well, at some level they were a tough generation. Uh, they were used to suffering. They didn't have the same amenities that we have today or the same expectations. Um, there are all kinds of reasons of how they endured. They had small reward systems. Letters from home were important. Um, the issuing of medals to keep soldiers fighting it mattered for some men, didn't matter for others. Daily um, Daily shots of rum were critically important for soldiers. To those who had survived another day, who had survived a cold night, they received a very stiff shot of rum in the morning. And rum was part of the reward system. Um, everyone smoked like a chimney. Um, these were simple pleasures, a leave system. So soldiers didn't spend four years in the front line trenches. They were rotated to the rear and life behind the lines was quite quite palatable. They were in the farmers fields, they were interacting with French and Belgian civilians. There was the threat of punishment and there was real punishment. This is the war we executed 25 Canadians for running away from the front. 22 for running away and three for other cases. So um, it's a complex constellation of factors that kept soldiers in the trenches. And as you said, some of them did break down, about 9,000 cases of shell shock. The question that has always struck me is why not more? Why didn't everyone break down at some point? And I think um, uh, there's no simple answer to that. And, and I spent 1,200 pages writing about this, uh, the soldiers' experiences. Um, and other people will keep writing about that because I think it continues to fascinate uh, and horrify us. Well, we're a nation about four times as large, so we're about 34 million. So you take those figures, you multiply by four. So 60,000 dead, with another 6,000 Canadians who died in the two or three years after the war from injuries, from influenza. Today's equivalent would be about 250,000 dead over a four-year period. It would be about 600,000 wounded in body, in mind, and in spirit. 600,000. 600,000. So 172,000 multiplied by four. So around that, even in fact more than that. And that gives you a sense of what this generation had to go through. There was no community, no city, no, no town, no village, no hamlet that did not suffer. And we see that today. The memorials are still there. Those stone memorials built after the First World War with the names of the fallen on them. And you can go to every small town in this country and they're still there. And you look at them and you see 38 names or 22 names and you think, my goodness, how many people actually lived here? There's probably only 200 in this small town. One in every four men didn't come back who went overseas, or whatever the figure is. And it was the vagaries of chance. Some, some communities were hit harder than others. They're still there. They're in the stained glass windows in churches. Um, they're in the schools that are over 100 years old. They have the lists of the fallen. They're in commemorative booklets. And they are carried, I think, in the hearts of millions of Canadians who have a strong genealogical link to the First World War. We have to think about that. Um, we have to think of the 60,000 dead or the 66,000 dead. Each one of them had parents or children or wives or sisters. Think of the next level of community. Ch everyone was in a church. Everyone was a part of a a factory or on a farm. And then so you think of the sort of levels of grief emanating out. This was a country, our country, that was steeped in grief and loss. Um, and it is a wonder that they were able to um, make sense of that in the 1920s and the 1930s and to um, 
uh, and imagine the same generation as with the lead up to 1938 and 39 when it looks like there will be another world war. Uh, imagine the feelings in Canadians who said, we fought this thing a generation ago. We paid a terrible blood sacrifice and here we are again. And in fact, many First World War soldiers served in the Second World War. I mean, one of the reasons why we still care about the Great War is, is, is because it was such a traumatic event in our history. I think there are three major tropes that you have to understand for the First World War. The first is the tremendous loss of life. So 60,000 dead. That had a tremendous impact on Canada, uh, which it took decades to recover from. The second major one is that this is the war where Canada stepped out onto the world stage, where we stood shoulder to shoulder with Britain, where we took justifiable pride in our fighting forces overseas, where we made a name for ourselves. And that will lead to eventual political and evolutionary and constitutional changes. But the third trope or the third major narrative that you have to acknowledge is that the war, while it may have made the country, nearly tore it apart. And that, of course, culminated in the 1917 conscription crisis election, which is the most divisive event in our history, in my opinion, which pitted English versus French, which pitted uh, those who lived on the farms against those who lived in the cities, which pitted labor against those who were holding the capital. It tore our country apart. And you can't reduce the First World War, in my mind, to simply a nation-building event. To do so is to lose the complexity and the nuances that make this such an important event in Canadian history. We were never the same after the First World War. And I think that that's especially important now as we come upon the 100th anniversary and there will probably be a desire to make this into a nation-building event because I think there is an element of truth there. But if we forget the fact that it also nearly tore the country apart, we will be doing a disservice to why this war was so important to, to Canadians. I think the war does provide um, that fulcrum for much of Canada uh, to see itself forged in a new way. And so 50 years in from Confederation, uh, we fight this terrible war and we emerge from it bruised and battered and bloodied with a new sense of pride in ourselves, with new national symbols, the Canadian Corps, with new heroes, Billy Bishop, Arthur Curry, um, and having paid a terrible blood sacrifice, things that cost you, and in this case, terrible cost, 60,000 dead, you remember in different ways. All of those things come together to create this, what you might call an imagined community, a sense of the war as a great change event in our history. But not all Canadians believe that. And if you were a Ukrainian Canadian who was interned during the war for being supposedly disloyal, that's a very different war effort. Uh, it, does Vimy Ridge still resonate in your community? When, when you look around and you see that, in fact, Ukrainian Canadians have served overseas in battles, some with great courage, one of them, Phil, Philip Conowal, who wins the Victoria Cross at Battle Hill 70, and others are being interned because they are seen as disloyal. Um, can you use the First World War and Vimy Ridge and other signs and symbols and icons like that as a nation-building event when in Quebec it is taught as a nation-destroying event? That it was Anglo politicians and who imposed this on Quebec, even though, of course, tens of thousands of Quebecers are serving overseas in the fighting forces. The Van Dues are there. Um, so it's a complex event. And not all Canadians believed at the time or in the war's aftermath or even today that the First World War is the right symbol for the nation. The First World War saw the introduction of income tax and women were receiving the right to vote and all of that is largely forgotten today and the and government intervention to the lives of Canadians. Um, the First World War is brought up because it has become and it has passed into the symbolic realm. Since the First World War is one of these critical icons and I think that gets boiled down largely into Vimy Ridge. Um, for other Canadians it doesn't resonate in any manner. 
but then if you were to step take a step back it's very hard to find a single symbol or image or icon that would resonate with all Canadians. Um, all nations have multiple symbols, multiple events that they draw upon to bind their citizens together. I